How do you tell others about what you think is worth telling? No one was ever given exact directions. You were turned no. loose in a region. And the assignment was see what is really there. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What actually is the human condition? It's uh, hard to get by. Between Buck Creek and Whitewater Creek, nobody can make a living. I remember when the Yankees came through. Yeah, yeah, a whole passel of them hollered and told the Negroes, you free. I don't know whether that drought was the devil's work or the Lord's work. In three days, everything wilted. This country's a hard country. They won't help bury you here. If you die, you're dead. That's all. This life is simplicity boiled down. Yes, sir, we've starved, stalled, and stranded. Living a bum's life should make a bomb out of you. So it seemed like I they couldn't leave nothing if I went back. A human being has a right to stand like a tree. They don't stop right the stand. door, they just walk out. The human face is the universal language. The same expressions are readable, understandable all over the world. It's explosions of emotion and passion, all concentrated on just this part of the human anatomy. One day I was working here, and it came to me. The deprived and the dislocated. And then the word came to me, rootless. The walking wounded. It was another phrase that was in my mind. The last ditch. The last ditch. Welcome to Dorothea Lang, Words and Pictures. I'm Sarah Meister, curator of this exhibition. We've invited a couple of contemporary artists, a poet, and Dorothea Lang's granddaughter to share their thoughts on Lang and some of the words and pictures on view here. We're standing in front of a photograph that Dorothea Lang chose to call Migratory Cotton Picker, Eloy, Arizona. But in fact, there's much more information on file at the Library of Congress. There, she wrote, resting at Cotton Wagon before returning to work in the field. He has been picking cotton all day. A good picker earns about $2 a day working at this time of year. To our right is an enlargement of the end papers from Lang's landmark photo book, An American Exodus. Lang cared a lot about words and pictures and the relationship between them. And An American Exodus is the most important example of her bringing these two things together. Here's the poet, Tess Taylor. It's documenting people moving out of the small farms of the Midwest and the South and into the West. The texture of their lives is changing so rapidly and they're in the face of forces that are enormous. The economy, the changing of the climate, the Dust Bowl happening. Dorothea Lang would go and talk to people, listen to what they had to say, sneak back to the car, and write down these snippets. All we got to start with is a family of kids. I couldn't do nothing if I went back. We trust in the Lord and we don't expect much. Yes, sir, we're starved, stalled, and stranded. They say we took work cheap, but you got to take work cheap, and we didn't want a relief. Somebody said that, and she wrote it down, and... It's 
an amazing way of capturing this chorus of everyday voices and their music and their passion and their sense of justice. I'm Diana Taylor, a cinematographer and documentary filmmaker, and I'm Dorothea Lang's granddaughter. The White Angel Breadline helped the men in the Depression who were hungry and on the streets looking for work. My grandmother had been a portrait photographer and had a studio in San Francisco. Her studio was at a crossroads where she could look down and see the men drifting about down there. She said, I've got to go down there and challenge myself. I'm going to photograph this thing to see if I can grab a hunk of lightning. This gentleman with the cup that he's hoping will be filled with soup and his beaten hat turned away from all the others is very powerful. She was a tiny woman and had a limp left over from severe polio when she was a child. She was carrying a heavy camera, and yet she somehow could blend in to a crowd. She had a magical way of doing that. She never looked back after that. This really inspired her. Seeing that that photograph told a powerful story, I think moved her to leave her portrait studio work and turn to the streets. I've looked at this photograph many times, and I've always been struck by the rim of light that falls on the woman's face, her shoulder, and on her hands. But those hands tell us about a life of work and the life of care. This photograph was taken during a time when my grandmother and her husband, Paul Taylor, were working for the Farm Security Administration. At that time, the government was sending out photographers to photograph the conditions around America. This image is titled, Ex-Slave with a Long Memory, and it was taken in Alabama in 1937. She doesn't always caption it, sometimes it's basic, but Ex-Slave with a Long Memory makes us pause and think. It's hard enough to take a good portrait of one person, to get six men who are in a state of distress, who are without work, who are struggling to make a living, presenting themselves to you is a real accomplishment. This image, taken in 1937, is called Six Tenant Farmers Without Farms, Hardeman County, Texas. Dorothea must have approached them to ask if she could take their portrait. But she always did this in such a delicate way. Dorothea gained the trust of her subjects by letting them get to know her a little bit before she produced the camera. She sometimes even allowed them to ask questions about why she was there. How many children did she have? Why was she interested in photographing them? And I think they all felt less threatened and she was able to make them feel more comfortable. I'm Tess Taylor. I'm a poet and writer. This is a photograph called On the Road to Los Angeles, California, March 1937. What I love about this image is it really demonstrates Lang's ability to capture a paradox. Next time, try the train. Her images are able to convey so much, and often they cut against each other. They're about suffering and dignity, or they're about the story we wish were true and the story that really is true. In my poetry, I wove my own travels to the places Dorothea Lang went. So I just want to read a little fragment called Note to Self. And all of these are notes that Dorothea Lang made as she was traveling in the 1930s or 40s. Note to Self, possible title to hold this soil. Note to self, general theme of book, people left stranded by the outwash of industry in America. Note to self, US 99, the splendor and the rest of it. Note, young trees. Note, poor man's canyon. 
a subject on the move. Note to self, really do the work, follow the whole travel, destination unknown. One, the method. Two, this still blank. A book on the conditions of us. My name is Wendy Redstar. I'm a visual artist. I'm originally from Montana. I grew up on the Crow Indian Reservation. We're looking at a photograph of a barren field in an abandoned house. It's called Tractored Out, Childress County, Texas. Immediately when I saw this image, I felt a lot of empathy, something about the starkness that reminded me a lot of the landscapes of where I grew up and the initiative of the government to assimilate my community, the Crow Nation, into farmers. And immediately I thought about the first occupants, the indigenous people who once were on these very fertile prairies and then these farming communities coming and then they were also pushed off with this destruction of giant dust storms and great hardship for the landscape. A lot of times people don't feel like they connect to indigenous people. But to me, this was like two communities that were both forced out that could come together on that shared experience. It's 1942, with the horrifying and surprising attack on Pearl Harbor, the government made a very rash decision to intern the Japanese Americans that were living on the West Coast. Dorothea was hired by the government rather quickly to document the rounding up of the Japanese in the Bay Area. We see almost immediately in her earliest photographs of this assignment her distress at what the government is doing to the Japanese American citizens. And in the photograph of the little girl dutifully holding her hand over her chest and saying the Pledge of Allegiance, we can already see that Dorothea is at her eye level and showing us with great compassion the earnestness of this child and that she is already a well-formed American citizen and yet she's gonna be taken away and put in an internment camp. Tess Taylor. I love this image because this woman looks happy and she looks like she's arrived. And there she is in Richmond, California in 1942. Richmond was an end point on what is called the Great Migration. Dorothea Lange knew a lot about displaced people. And she's so consciously celebrating this moment. The Henry Kaiser shipyards in Richmond were America's first desegregated workplace. So maybe one of the reasons I'm drawn to this picture is for at least this moment, a woman is standing, dressed in beautiful clothes, bathed in sunshine, and she's getting a little slice of the California dream or her own dream. My name is Wendy Redstar. I'm a visual artist. I'm originally from Montana. This image reminds me of me, actually. When I was growing up on the Crow Indian Reservation, I was practically raised by horses. Looking at this little boy's face and how comfortable he is is something that very much resonates with me. The horse looks like a landscape itself. And the way that she was able to do a tight shot that shows this, this boy's expression, that he's just perfectly comfortable on this mountainscape of a horse, that he can smile at her and have no fear of falling off. I thought that she did a really great job of capturing this real bond between this child and the horse. I think that's 
really a true art form that Dorothea has, this rapport with her subjects. And that's not easy to do. It's almost like he's showing her his greatest passion or his talent. And there's a lot of pride in that. Here we find ourselves in June 1936 with a plantation overseer and his field hands in the Mississippi Delta. The overseer, proud and full of himself, hand on knee, foot on bumper. What we can see in the photograph is my grandfather standing on the far left edge of the frame, distracting the overseer so that Dorothea can actually see the men behind him as they gaze directly at the camera. My grandfather, Paul Taylor, was a field economist, and Dorothea and he worked together as a team on the reports that they did for the government. My grandfather often would interview subjects in this way so that Dorothea could photograph them without their paying much attention to her. They used her photographs to illuminate what they were really seeing on the ground, and it made a great difference in how the government received the information that they were given. When I see this photograph, Spring in Berkeley, of Dorothea's good neighbor, I'm reminded of my grandmother's unique sense of humor. I'm sure she was drawn to the rakish way in which the hat is staying on her wonderful neighbor's head and the curlers. And she's rooted to the sidewalk like the plants are in some way with her outstretched leg and her floral skirt and her gardening cardigan. Everything about it would have made my grandmother smile. I just love this photo. This photograph has been used and seen so many times that Dorothea once said to me, it doesn't belong to me, really. It belongs to the public. It's just part of the imagery we think of when we think of the Depression in America. Dorothea had been traveling alone on assignment in California and was heading back toward Berkeley when she passed a sign that said Pea Pickers Camp. She drove on and then began to argue with herself, maybe I should go back. The crops had frozen, and almost everyone was out of work and very hungry. She spotted a woman alone with children. Dorothea took seven negatives of the woman, Florence Thompson and her children, and the final image is the one that we've all come to know so well. When Dorothea returned to Berkeley, she submitted some of the images to the press the public was very moved by the images, and aid was soon sent down to the pea pickers camp. I think Dorothea saw the expressive possibilities in hands. My name is Sam Contus. I'm an artist. I was working in the Dorothea Lang archive at the Oakland Museum of California, and I saw a picture of Dorothea Lange and her second husband, Paul Taylor, embracing. Dorothea didn't physically take the picture. She's taken this larger negative, and she's cropped in very close and made a print that just shows these hands on an anonymous back. And so I understood that it was her body in the photograph and that the hands were the hands of Paul Taylor. And I thought that was just such a beautiful gesture in so many ways. I also really liked the way she's printed it. The figures, to my mind, become immortalized. They could be statues. They look like marble or stone carvings. And the title, Paul's Hands, gives it this very personal touch and personal feeling. It feels like a really loving gesture both as a nod to her husband, but also finding that thing that you love in a photograph and wanting to get closer to it and holding on that particular moment in an image. Um. 
In the 50s, Dorothea took it upon herself to document a beautiful valley in Northern California that was going to be flooded. Her interest was in the life of that valley. What we see behind the horse is the wasteland, which once was the beautiful valley in town of Monticello. You no longer see the fence, the field, the orchard, the ivy-covered homes, the ranch hands, women talking on doorsteps, the county store. You don't see any of that anymore. You just see what's left, which is the horse running with no place to go. Dorothea was an early environmentalist, and the assignment, which became a small book called Death of a Valley, documented the painful, painful raising of an entire way of life and the sadness with which the people had to leave their homes, a place they'd lived for decades. Words can be true and words can be false and they can be misleading and they can be supportive. And this was something that Lang thought about really deeply. Hi, I'm Sarah Meister. I'm a curator in the Department of Photography at the Museum of Modern Art, and I organize the exhibition Dorothea Lang Words and Pictures with my colleague River Bullock. So unfortunately right now, Dorothea Lang's pictures are hanging in dark galleries at the museum, and I'm actually speaking to you from my mom's house in Connecticut, um, which, which has its ups and downs. Adam, could, who, is somebody unloading the dishwasher? Alliteration is a weakness of mine. But when I say, for the love of Lang, what I mean is that in working on this project, everybody seemed to understand the way in which Lang was calling us to be our best selves. And so, for the love of Lang, oh, somebody's going into the kitchen with the squeaky door. I was struck by a quote that was in her oral history that said, all photographs can be fortified by words. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure I even agree with that, but what an extraordinary statement for somebody who dedicated their life to making images. And then I started thinking about Lang's book, An American Exodus, that she did with her husband, Paul Taylor, in 1939. And this photo book is really, sorry, let me get my, let my dad go walk by. It's okay, it's not live. The minute you open An American Exodus, the end papers are the voices of the people that she photographed. Both she and Paul Taylor took copious notes. They understood how important it was to capture the voice, the authentic voice of these people she was photographing. Lang rarely, if ever, referred to herself as an artist, but that doesn't mean she wasn't conscious of the way in which to have her pictures reach their maximum effectiveness. They also had to function as works of art. So she had an extraordinary sense of composition. She always knew how to find the salient detail that really brought forward a story or a circumstance. She also never called herself an activist, even though her work was often in the service of a cause that was very important to her. She was capturing people throughout the Great Depression who had been blown about the United States as a result of the Dust Bowl and some disastrous farming policies. Her photograph, Migrant Mother, which is arguably her most famous image, actually prompted a response by the California state government to bring aid to thousands of starving pea pickers on the outskirts of Nipomo, California. I have a lot of favorite photographs by Lang, and um, in case you can't see what's on the editing room floor here, there are about a lot of me saying, um, um, I can't choose my favorite, um, because I really can't. However, if I were to say that right now, at this moment, um, my favorite Lang photograph might be one called Paul, Briefcase, and Umbrella. It's a picture of her husband, Paul Taylor. It's just of his hands, his briefcase, and his umbrella. Right now, when I'm working from home and so many of us are denied that simple pleasure of just getting up and going to the office every day, 
to me, what that represents of holding your briefcase and umbrella and the normalcy that that represents, um, that feels like a particularly appealing one these days. Thank you.